You know, there are two movies now I have the answers and nobody else does. Denis told me on Blade Runner, because I look inside of Harrison Ford's mind, I'm the only person that knows if he's the replicant or not. So he said that I can decide. So I have that secret now. And now with this movie, I have the secret to carry as well. The Thin Red Line. And wow, it brings back memories uh, just hearing that name. I think about Terrence Malick, um, who is, you know, a, a genius. And, you know, he's a guy who made two movies and disappeared for 20 years, which you just got to respect, you know? You got to respect anybody that just like, yeah, I'm going to go off and, and, you know, pursue some other interests and kind of just live life. I mean, I took about six years off. But I think 20 is like, that's, that's real. I can't say I took six years off. I was, I was doing other things. I was on tour mostly, but, but Terrence Malick is, you know, he's made two of my favorite films. Um, uh, well, many more than two, but t t two of the, the, the seminal films that he made, one is called Badlands. The other one's called Days of Heaven, both like, you know, must watch films for cinephiles and actors. And actually I remember the audition for that. And uh, it was maybe the worst audition I ever had. They, I walked in the casting office and they had like a desk turned on its side. And we were supposed to kind of like shoot, you know, imaginary bullets at each other and pretend to be in a war, which I guess makes sense if you're auditioning for a war movie, but I just couldn't do it. I don't know. I just couldn't get with the program. And I stood up in the middle of the audition and, you know, got sprayed by a thousand imaginary bullets and I just stopped and I said, I, I, I just can't, I don't know, I just felt too em embarrassed. I was probably just too naive as an actor to put, pull that off in that room. You know, maybe I just wasn't, you know, good enough or something, but, but I stopped in the middle of the audition, which is unheard of. And I, and I actually just, I, t I tapped out. I said, I can't do this. I, I, I'm not your guy. And uh, for some reason or another, Terrence and Malik called me up and I think we had met actually before that, just kind of on a general meeting. And he wanted me to play this part in the movie. We're going to attack a breast through platoon in reserve. We've got to cross those three folds of ground. You see? Once we get beyond that, we've got to attack that hill. And the part that he wanted me to play was to be the first person to die. And he said, well, if I cast you and you die really early on, then everyone watching the movie is going to know that no one's safe. Uh, so that, that was, I don't know if he was just kind of, you know, being nice, but that was, you know, uh, it, the, the role was important for him. When I was on set, there were these little like uh, leaves that if you touch them, these plants, they, they, they would close up. And I, I, and I can't remember if it was me or another character, but I was right there, we were, we were right near the camera. And as I can't remember, it was my character, someone else was dying. I just remember he saw one of those leaves near the frame and he was like, you know, just reach out and not touch the leaf. And it closed as the character was dying. And then he went and shot extreme like macro close-ups of the plant or something. I don't know if it's in the final film, but um, uh, I just remember, you know, how aware he was of his surroundings of nature. Fight Club. I remember when there was this rumor going around that they were making this really controversial book into a movie and David Fincher was directing. And it, there was a time there, like, I didn't realize it was just a year after Thin Red Line, but there was a time there where there was there were really special films, like kind of really edgy films that were challenging these, you know, a tour type directors that were just doing some incredible work. So it was one that I really wanted to be a part of and I, 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 I lobbied to be a part of. And I remember bleaching my hair 
and my eyebrows white. We did one pass, and I think it was Brad Pitt was like, um, said something about Billy Idol. You know, he was like blonder. You know, so we went we went uh, even whiter with it. I really enjoyed being on that set because I got to watch uh, Brad. He was incredibly loose and. Um, and naturalistic, you know, always does something a little different, take to take, and that was interesting to see. And everybody on it just kind of felt like we were, you know, kind of getting into trouble and doing, you know, something that was potentially special, but, you know, on the darker side of the universe. Yeah, working with Fincher was just a dream. Did you train a lot in fighting and prepare your body for that role? No, I don't think we rehearsed very much at all from, from my memory. And it was supposed to be like you're fighting like you would you would fight, not like a professional fighter, I should, should say, like the character would fight. The only thing that wasn't real is we weren't actually hitting each other, but you did get hit at times you know it was it wasn't like it was perfectly choreographed you know it was all it was real as is as, as real fake as you could get um those fights were you know people are throwing each other all over the place but um it was a good one man it was really exciting it's under control sir Where's Tyler? Sir, the first rule of Project Mayhem is you do uh, not ask. Right, the, okay. I had the prosthetics at the end, something I had never done before. I think it was the first time that I'd worn prosthetics. And I remember getting super claustrophobic. I fell asleep while they put this big life cast on me made out of plaster. I fell asleep and then for like two minutes and then woke up and I was inside this thing and I didn't know where I was. So I like started ripping it off, running down the street and, uh, had a full on just claustrophobic uh, attack. Yeah, I avoid those, Those they're called life casts. I avoid those to this day. Requiem for a Dream. Yeah, Requiem for a Dream was, it's a big one for me uh, personally and, you know, made such a big impact on my life and my, my career. It was just the 20th anniversary, which is really hard to believe. Uh, I was talking with Darren Aronofsky about it and we just were like, wait, uh, someone get the dates wrong this is just impossible but yeah life-changing experience i remember we knew that like there was this young genius in town darren aronofsky he had made a movie called pie and there was a script floating around by you know uh, hubert selby jr and darren and based on hubert's book and it was just absolutely you know stunning script brutal just a brutal brutal read and heartbreaking but you know, something very, very special. And, you know, I fought really hard to be a part of that film. And, you know, Darren took a, a chance on me and I'll always be so grateful for that. But yeah, I remember going to New York and you know, living on the street and diving deep and really getting close to some of the folks that I met there that were living similar lives to Harry Goldfarb. Hey, what would happen if we went down there to cop? Are you serious? Why not? What the f are you saying? We supposed to walk up to some motherfucking room clerk at some motherfucking hotel and ask him for a connection? Get with it. You're telling me that you can't nose out some dope when it's around? Man, we got nothing to lose. It's wide open. And if we get there right away, we can name our own price and we can sit back and be cool and have those fucking fools scuffle the streets for us. Jennifer Connelly, one of, one of the greatest, and uh, Marlon. Uh, one of the funniest, and Ellen, a legend. It was just really special. We we all felt like, okay, this is an opportunity to see what we're made of, to push ourselves really hard. And I did go through a really intense body transformation for the role. My thought was I wanted it, I wanted a, the character to be in a place of constant, you know, starvation, of craving, of desire. And food was a great way to do that. I also, just from own my own experience and education, knew that, you know, it would 
be a good physical representation of somebody that was living in that world at that time. Really unique because I think Darren demanded like eight weeks of rehearsal or something, which is never, you never do. You know, you're lucky if you rehearse at all on a movie. And, you know, I think he was a little surprised when he thought, you know, he was encouraging us all to go deep. And then when I went deep, I don't think he expected it to go that far, but it was a beautiful experience. Oh, no. Oh, she won't. She'll come. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's there's no method in the world that could make your arm go away. But uh, I, mean, I guess there is. But yeah, I think there was a green, you know, there was a blue or green uh, sleeve on it. And uh, or there was a, some kind of a trick. I, I can't remember, but effective, I guess, you know. Um, and it was just like that, that, that there were days, there were days that were just full of tears and pain and other days that were full of hope and dreams. And Hubert Selby would always, I think he would say that the book was about the American dream and how that can be a drug in and of itself, a, a harrowing experience. Uh, I remember almost every moment of that film. It's funny how some things make such an impact on you. Mr. Nobody. Mr. Nobody is kind of my secret film. Uh, you know, m most people never even heard of it. Uh, but there was a movie I made right before that, which maybe we should make a little special note of, called Chapter 27. Played a guy named Mark David Chapman, who uh, had the, you know, distinct badge of uh, taking John Lennon's life. Um, and I gained uh, 67 pounds and... It was a, a character study about this, you know, just dis disturbed and disturbing person um, and a very, very big physical transformation. When I look back at it, I kind of, I wish maybe someone had stopped me and said, hey, no, 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 no. Maybe like 20 pounds is good. Maybe get some prosthetics. Uh, but I, I went for it and it was fascinating how the, the, that gaining that 60 something pounds changed the way that I walked, that changed the way that I talked, changed the way even that I laughed. Certainly, I was unrecognizable. I remember running into Darren Aronofsky at some Oscar party, and I still hadn't shed the weight from the film. And I walked up to him at a party, and I was face to face with him. And this is a guy who knows my face really well, having directed it, but he, he didn't even recognize me. He said, can I help you? And I said, it's me, it's Jared. And then he just literally fell down on the floor. Like he fell down, he slid down the wall onto his onto the floor with his face in his hands. He could not believe that it was me. It was quite, quite a um, fun party trick. But anyway, that's chapter 27. Very, 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 very challenging, uh, dark movie. But, you know, um, was, a, was a big step as far as the transformation and transformative uh, approach to things. And Mr. Nobody, it's my European movie. It was made by a really beautiful team of collaborators in Belgium, uh, but Jaco van Dormeel was the director uh, and he's just a terrific talent. You know, quite a beautiful uh, experience, really beautiful group of people. That's a film for, for the thinkers out there, the philosophers, I think. it's. It's a heady one. Can you tell me how old you are? Oh, I'm 34. I was born on February 9th, 1975. Who are you? I'm Mr. Nobody, a man who doesn't exist. I played the oldest man in the world. 120-year-old man, 120-something. And uh, yeah, I play, I play, you know, a dozen or so versions of the same person all on, you know, parallel tracks, uh, diverging and crossing. And when I played the old man, I really felt, you know, kind of at home in a strange way. It was a full prosthetics piece. I thought they did a really great job. It was a team out of Berlin. Yeah, I really got into to playing the old man. That was quite funny. And he looked a lot like my grandfather. 
So I guess they got it right. It was many, many, many hours. But, and and I, I wouldn't be able to do that again because I get pretty claustrophobic. And, you know, that was full head piece. I mean, that goes on and you're, you're in it. You can't pull it off if you wanted to. So it's, uh, yeah, it makes my palms sweat just thinking about it. Dallas Buyers Club. Well, it had been about five or six years since I made a movie, I think. And then uh, I got this script and I was on tour with 30 Seconds to Mars at that point. I really was so busy and things were going so well. You know, it was like, why am I going to get off this ride right now to go make a film? I, I wasn't in any hurry to make a film, not to sound ungrateful, but my brother and I had worked for so many years. I mean, we were signed as a band in 1998 and we were making demos and playing music many, many years before that. So, you know, we had just finally started to get some traction. I think we started playing uh, arenas uh, just a year or two before that uh, all over the world. And it was just like this impossible dream had come true. So, uh, you know, firmly entrenched in that world and, and focusing on that. And then the script comes along and I thought, I just read it and I just knew that it was something special. I fell in love with the character and the opportunity and the challenge and, you know, the, the ability to kind of learn new things and to go on a brand new adventure. Relax, I don't bite. I guess you're handsome in a Texas hick white trash dumb kind of way. Get the f out of here. Whatever you are before I kick you in the f***ing face. Not a big You want to play cards? You know, for me, what I remember are the people that were involved. I remember the time and the places. I remember being in New Orleans for Dallas Buyers Club. I remember, you know, the, the people that I met with that, you know, helped educate me and guide me and advise me and teach me and that support and that love. I remember all of that as, as the, the most. Um, you know, of course, there's a whole other phase of that movie when it came out and, you know, it was... Uh, well received and we won awards that's a whole other kind of aspect but the making of the film was again immersive transformative and um you know Sean Mark Fallet just a, a really brave filmmaker and I knew Matthew was in a place where he was doing just really incredible work so I felt happy just to be a, a, a small part of it to be honest <laughs> Okay, I'm taking you to the hospital. My no, no, no. Rayon. No. Rayon, trust me. You no! Need... I don't want to die. You're not going to die. die. You're not going to die. No, just come, trust me. Come on. It's a big loss to experience that weight loss and that kind of starvation and that physical and mental goal when you're playing those roles. Yes, definitely. Uh, uh, I don't know how you do it another way, but everyone has their own method. You know, I have mine, other people have theirs. And, you know, they, 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 to varying degrees, we all have our methodology. And um, I kind of shy away from the term method actor because it, I think, has taken on negative connotations. I always think of it you know, my approach to acting, it's my job to do the best I can to help contribute in a meaningful way and to help tell the story, help bring a character to life, to, to be a pleasure to work with, to be kind and generous to my other actors. Like all of that's part of the same bucket. And, um, you know, it's, uh, different people just have different approaches. And, you know, uh, I think it's up to everyone just to do what they're comfortable doing to contribute in, in a meaningful way. I mean, people work so hard on movies, you know, directors, writers, 20 years that guy had the script for Dallas Buyers Club. 
and the producers and the studio, the people that invest the money, the crew, you know, when you show up, you know, I always think, wow, I, I, it, this is, uh, I better not let anybody down. I, I do remember the process though. I did lose so much weight. Um, people started treating me different, which was uh, good for the character and interesting and also surreal, even off the set, you know, people, I, I guess I looked like I was, you know, really ill or probably looked like I was dying. You know, it was interesting to see how people would deal with that. Um, so that was, a, that, that's something that you don't, you, you can't really imagine. You just have to experience it. Suicide Squad. Stepping into the Joker's shoes is like, you know, it's an incredible opportunity. I guess it's this generation's version of like, you know, taking on an infamous Shakespearean character. Lots of people have played the part before. Lots of people played it in the future. So you really, it's it's an opportunity to kind of, to do something new and to explore, you know, uh, challenging territory. And we had a lot of fun with it. Um, but it's it's also interesting how this stuff all takes on a life of its own. Uh, but I, I, did, I never gave Margot Reb, Robbie a a dead rat. Uh, that's just, that's not true. I, I actually the, the gave her, um, you know, a lot of, I found this place in Toronto that had great uh, vegan cinnamon buns. And that was a, a very uh, common thing. What do we have here? I did everything you said. I helped you. Uh, you helped me. By erasing my mind, what infated memories I had. Oh. You left me in a black hole of rage and confusion. Without the medicine you practice, Dr. Quinzel. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna kill me, Mr. J? What? I remember walking the streets of Toronto at night and, you know, rehearsing my lines and going over things. Uh, and, and, you know, there, there, there's a lot of pressure when you are part of those big movies. You know, for not even, just forget the character for a second. When you're part of these giant movies, they're, they're inherently come with even uh, maybe more responsibility, it feels like. Maybe it shouldn't, and that's, that's maybe my fault to not try to filter that out. But um, I've done mostly smaller movies. I mean, Dallas Buyers Club was a $4 million movie. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's an experimental film in a lot of ways. Um, same with Mr. Nobody. It's a, it was a small, independent, uh, European film. Uh, so that was like a step into a whole new world. But it was it was a, it was a lot of fun, and there was a, a just a mutual kind of respect and support on the set, and you know, just the feeling of camaraderie. You know. I stay a little bit separate because I felt my, my my character was a little bit separate, but I really was, was it was great to always hear all the laughter and the camaraderie that was you know in abundance on the set. Blah 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 blah. All of that chit chat's gonna get you hurt. Oh my god. And the other thing I loved on that set was. A lot of times I play dark, I'm in darker films and I play darker characters. Certainly in Requ Requiem, you know, uh, there wasn't a ton of laughter on the set probably, but what was fun with the Joker was, he, you know, he, he said such outlandish things all the time. I can often hear the crew like stifling laughter or the camera if it was on the shoulder would be shaking because people would be laughing. And it, that was really fun just to kind of entertain the troops and play with, with humor. Uh, and, and that, that, that experience kind of, I, I think, you know, is, is something that I carried with me and some of the other stuff that I've done. Blade Runner 2049. Ridley Scott, Blade Run, the original Blade Runner. I mean, one of my top, films uh for me just the genius movie i i fell in love with that movie on vhs as a kid and watched it over and over and it just it, it taught me a lot about cinema and acting and set design and 
creativity. I remember getting the call, Neander Wallace. And I was like, okay. As soon as I saw that name on the script, I thought, wow, this is, where do we go from here? This is amazing. Uh, But I can't believe I got to be in Blade Runner. I mean, for me, that's like, you know, just now I know I'm living in a simulation for sure. Yeah, just, just incredible. To preserve the clay. It's fascinating. Before we even know what we are. I had these contacts made that were opaque, so I couldn't see, which was actually kind of great because I didn't have to get confronted with the problem of, you know, uh, acting um, like I couldn't see. I actually couldn't see. And I had a really wonderful teacher, a guy named Chris, who was, who is blind and uh, an amazing um, coach. And we actually modeled my eyes in the film after his eyes in real life. And he was just just, just a really special person. Uh, he's just a really special person. And, you know, uh, there's there's a lot of him and in, in, in that kind of, in the physicality, that performance. I have wanted to meet you for so very long. You are a wonder to me, Mr. Deckard. Working with Harrison Ford again, a dream. Just, I couldn't see him, uh, but that voice, and I remember reaching out, I had to hold his hand for a minute, and that was great. I know you know something. Help me, and very, very good things can come to you. You don't have children. Do you? Well, I have millions. I'll tell you a quick anecdote from that. So we finished up the scene, long shoot day, very intense in this cavernous office. You could hear your voice echoing off the walls. And we did the scene a bunch of times, bunch of times. And um, it was my first day on set. We're finished up. And they kind of brought me, shuffled me off to the side, the, the AD did. And I was standing there alone and someone comes up to me and wraps their arms around me and gives me this huge hug, very emotional hug. I, I'm not sure because I couldn't see, but I felt like there you know, may have been like uh, tears flowing. Uh, and it was uh, Harrison Ford. And it, it was a really special and beautiful moment. And, you know, I, th- I think that he went somewhere really special in that scene. And I was so happy to be there with him, you know, as he was uh, putting such great work on the screen. The little things. Well, uh, good old Albert Sparma. I'd be really happy if I saw someone dressed up as Albert Sparma for Halloween. That would be a fun one, right? You must really like my car. I do. How's the trunk space? Again, it was incredibly transformational. It was a different eye color, different nose. I had some other prosthetics. I had different teeth. Um, There was a walk and there was a different way of speaking. And um, I really just wanted to bring to life a character that, that people hadn't spent time with before. And I felt like, you know, Albert Sparma, from the name itself, you knew he was someone different. He's an outsider, a bit of a a dark horse and you know I wanted to explore that territory and you know just dove in deep how's the trunk space I was so thrilled to be working with one of my heroes in uh, Denzel Washington you know the master of the goat he is uh, just Terrific. And Rami Malek was just a phenomenal partner in this. 
you know, I think the three of us felt like there was an opportunity here and we all just jumped in the ring with one another. And, you know, it was, it was explosive.